if I pull it too hard, I'm gonna take it off. Okay. It's pulling a little. Okay, less pressure now. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. Hmm. Hello. And welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. Cabinets HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Igor. Igor, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jason. Igor is originally from Ukraine. He came to the U.S. 14 years ago, and he literally had $30 in his pocket, no friends, no job, no place to stay, and he virtually spoke no English. Just when he learned some basic English, he moved to Miami to study finance. He later became the first Ukrainian president of a Latino business student organization with 400 members. After successfully helping all of them find jobs, he then landed a job in Microsoft and moved to Seattle. Microsoft was his job number 27, and just like with all the previous jobs he had, he actually never applied for it. After spending four years in virtually every role in finance at Microsoft, he decided to live a life of no regrets and start his own company, Brain Rich the current focus on the physical and mental development of the kids. Over the years, he has worked and consulted in hospitality, retail, manufacturing, e-commerce, and even construction. It is his passion to help businesses to discover and execute on the missed opportunities. Thank you very, very much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Every day. <laughs> yes. So you came to Ukraine at 14. Why did you come to the United States? So now I can explain it a little bit different. Um, after I've read the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich. So now I can explain it looking backwards. Uh, when I grew up in Ukraine, a poor country, I grew up uh, during the 90s and uh, everybody was poor, economy collapsed and everything. I've developed a fear of being poor. So when I came to the States, uh, there's the whole story, how I came and all this stuff. There was a, a project, an equivalent of landing on, on the moon. Uh, required money, uh, knowledge, and all this stuff. I didn't have any of those. So that story on its own uh, is a little experience. But I came here because of the fear of being poor. Uh, essentially, I didn't know how to live in Ukraine, how to make money. So I came here. Uh, my primary goal at that time was to get an education because the, my perception was if you get an American education, then you're set for life. You know, they, then you come back to any country, Ukraine or whatnot, and everybody's like, here's a job, and here's a lot of money for you, and you're all set for life. One of the many so, American myths. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, just to make a story short or a little bit more interesting, when I came here first time, uh, I only stayed here for, for a summer, for four months. Uh, I worked in the kitchen. I did uh, all this like $6 an hour job, worked 100 hours per week with a three day off uh, for the whole summer. And then I came back to Ukraine and this is when I got my first culture of shock because people there thought uh, as soon as I landed here, people just gave me money and I had so much that I couldn't carry, right? So when I came back to Ukraine, this is when I got my culture of shock, not, not when I came to the US, but when I came back home. So, and, uh, and then after that, I spent essentially a year planning on, uh, on my return. And then when I finally land here, I'm like, I'm not leaving anywhere. Uh, this is the only place where I could survive. So that's, uh, that was my motivation to survive, essentially. And did you come here by yourself? Your family came with you? Uh, so at first I came by, by myself. And then at 14 years old, all the way from Ukraine? That's... No, no, no. That was 14 years ago. Oh, okay. 14 uh, years ago. Okay. Yeah, I was 20. And then I came back when I was 21. But still at 20 years old, that's, you know, all the, yeah. all the way from Ukraine. So the first time I came, I, I knew five words, essentially, in English. Uh, I spent four months, still didn't pick up much. I only knew... You know, like this is called that and this is called this. And uh, I used to be a go-kart track attendant. So my language uh, skills were limited to no bumping <laughs> and, uh, M, M, uh, you know, like a very curse word that I cannot uh, say here. And then, uh, yeah, a couple more words that I didn't, uh, I cannot even pronounce it on the air because they were all curse words. That's all I knew. So why the United States? Like, why not another country? Because the United States was like the one everyone wants to go to or was there, uh, was there reasoning besides America is like, that was uh, by an accident, just like uh, a lot of things. Uh, I, I think that I'm lucky. Um, and I literally walked in uh, at my university. So an advertisement pulled it. You know, like they used to have an advertisement, the phone number that you have to pull and rip off. I called. There was a training for leadership. 
uh, came there, came there to met a guy and uh, training never happened, but he said like, Hey, I opened this uh, company. Um, they're sending students to the United States. You want to try? And by the way, it costs 2,500 bucks. And my mom at that time, single mom, she was making a thousand dollars per year. Right. So to go to the States, that would cost me 2,500. Right. And then, uh, we just went to the bank and I said like, Hey, can we get a loan? And that was at the time when nobody even had a debit card. Right. And we went to the bank uh, to apply for a loan. And guess what? The bank said like, Oh, you're going to America. There you go. It's like a business plan. So they give us a loan. So we actually started a program. So I brought a uh, first year I went, I brought 15 friends with me. The second year I brought 35 friends. And uh, essentially I was working an advertisement and that's how I got essentially the company fee waived, waived. So I paid for my airline ticket and the cost of the program. So I kind of paid, you know, I, I, I brought that guy a business more than he actually had. The first year when I brought 15 people, 20 people in total went. When I brought 35 people, 55-ish people went all together. So pretty much I gave him all the business and uh, it kind of way of th saying thank you. He waived his uh, couple hundred dollar fee. So that's how I was able to make it here. So you came to the States and you took you well, first of all, you came to the States and you told what where you're from, Ukraine. Do they like, I'm pretty sure they had no idea where you're from, right? So like they're, they're probably most Americans are bad at geography. They were like, Ukraine, what's that, you know? No, quite the opposite. So I landed in New York and I thought, oh, nobody speaks Russian or Ukrainian right here. And of course I'm walking in, in uh, Manhattan and I hear every language but English, <laughs> Not every language in the world but English. So, um, and that was uh, quite surprising, but they knew what Ukraine was. Uh, I visited Brooklyn later on. This was the first time I got scared because those people in Brooklyn, they left a long time ago and they, they, they left during the Soviet Union times and they, they, the culture and everything stayed kind of frozen. No, I, I remember reading that there's like, there's like a neighborhood in, in, in Brooklyn that's like all Russian, all Ukraine. It's like going like back to the, the country. That was the scariest neighborhood I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was scared uh, because of the service. And uh, not because of how people are scared looking people were there, but I uh, literally went to the restaurant and uh, we just sat down and brought my friends, my Russian friends, so they can try borscht, Ukrainian, uh, famous Ukrainian soup. So we just sat down and this lady comes in and is like, We're, are you ready to order? But no, it doesn't sound like that. But essentially she said like, what are you sitting here? You got to start worrying. Like, why are you wasting my time? You know, so that was kind of thing. But she's, she spoke in Russian very rude. It's kind of like, why are you even here? Like, you're wasting my time. You owe me kind of thing. Order, pay, go. Order, yeah. pay, go. Never. So, um, so in Ukraine, do they, do they all speak Ukrainian or Russian or different languages or? So I grew up in a part of, uh, Ukraine that is closer to Russia. So they spoke Russian for the most part. Uh, then I've learned Ukrainian from the books. So I've learned a proper language. So, uh, then people from, uh, from the part of Ukraine that are close to Poland, they would say that I speak, uh, not a proper Ukraine. <laughs> they speak proper Ukraine. And I say, well, you have a lot of words from a Polish language that you borrow. And those are not Ukraine. So we kind of have a battle. Uh, constant battle but uh yeah i speak both uh, actually i should say i understand both but i it's been a while since i spoke ukrainian last time and when you can mistake what kind of challenges do you did you have um or what kind of cultural differences were there so, that you noticed um, uh, you see those are i had challenges but i you know i woke up with a smile on my face every day so uh, you call them challenges to me that was kind of like a fun thing to do i barely spoke english so i didn't speak a word of english so i knew that i need a job and uh, I knew that hot sauce was not hot sauce, a hot sauce. Okay, that's all I knew. And uh, I knew that when I order iced tea, I have to say, uh, may I please have iced tea without ice? <laughs> so that was my, you know, because otherwise they would give me ice. And I hated water with ice at that time. And I still don't drink water with ice. So my challenges were to, how do you find a job? How do you explain what you can do? Uh, then, uh, you know, fears of being rejected because you don't speak English and all of these things, right? Uh, a typical immigrant story. I'm not, I'm not alone in this uh, area, but uh, everybody welcomed me. Said so like, yeah, sure. I had, uh, so I had 27 jobs. Every job is a, is a, is a story on its own. At some point uh, during my first years in the, in the States, I had three jobs. So I was, uh, I was a go-kart track attendant. Then I would go to the restaurant and I was a cook slash manager and then slash deliver driver. Then I would go and be a security guard. So I literally worked 24 hours. But when I was a security guard at that time, I would come in, I would sit and barely moving because I was so tired by that time. And then a couple hours later, the manager would leave. The hotel would close down. Literally, it's a closed community. And I would go sleep with the radio next to me. And I would wake up the minute I hear something on the radio. So that was uh, my summer, right? And then for the whole 
summer. I think I made, let's go like $10,000, which was a tremendous amount of money. But then I didn't know I had to pay rent. I had to pay $8 or whatever it was, $7 for a gallon of milk, something like that. That was crazy to me. I didn't know that. In Ukraine at that time, you would make $6 per day. Right. So that's kind of to give you an idea uh, how it felt. You make a good point. Like, I don't think like most people born in America, they don't realize the drive and focus that immigrants bring here, right? Because like you see all these jobs, all this focus trying to make it. And most Americans wake up nine to five and are content, right? They don't understand that the, what we have for opportunities that we have here. It has to take like immigrants to come in and take advantage of it sometimes. So interestingly, I've developed uh, this uh, big question in my mind. Why do you, have, do you even have homeless people? And now we're in Seattle with homeless people. It's one of the major problems. But at that time, I couldn't understand. I'm looking at people. They speak English. I'm like, how, how is it possible for you not, being, not to be able to find a job? So I was very oblivious. I didn't know where they come from. I didn't know who they are. I didn't know about the drug problem, all, all these things. So I was never able to, I was never able to understand that. Uh, then uh, I've learned that, hey, we make six bucks. But if you're an American, you make $14 an hour. So uh, I, of course, I got upset, but at the same time, like, hey, I'm still making like per hour as much as I would make per day in Ukraine. So I was still happy. You know, a lot of people get upset with that. There's a there's famous YouTube video on the monkeys getting upset for unequal pay. I don't know if you saw that. So when there's the scientists uh, feeding them uh, different food, uh, uh, cucumbers and then grapes, and they prefer grapes versus cucumbers. And you see the monkeys, they were getting cucumber, they're absolutely happy. And then you switch cucumber and you give one monkey the grapes that they love a lot better, right? So they make them do work, putting the stone in, and then the monkey sees that the other monkey is getting better rewards, and they start throwing back that <laughs> cucumber. So a similar story happens to a lot of us, right? Uh, no matter American or not, different cultures. So at that time, making six, seven dollars an hour, I didn't look, I didn't try to compare. I took it as like, oh, it's an opportunity to, to learn languages, not even one language. I like girls from different cultures, so. I picked up some Turkish, I picked up some uh, Mandarin, I picked up some, you know, like all of these interests. So I took it like free language school, free school of international relations. I started understanding cultures. I've never, so I come from Ukraine where everybody looks like me, walks like me, talks like me. Uh, I've seen five Asian guys across the street. Uh, they attended a university near mine. Uh, we saw, I saw one, uh, one black guy, he was from Africa. And uh, he was so tall that everybody thought that he's very good at basketball, which he was not. He was a <laughs> medical student. That was pretty much my exposure to uh, diversity of cultures, diversity of pretty much anything. So uh, I took that as a great opportunity to learn. So that's why I don't call those challenges. I call those uh, exciting experiments. Yeah. Uh, one thing, like a lot of Americans, like maybe people in general, where they have like an obstacle, they, they give up, not realize this is actual opportunity, right? You know? Another thing, I think a lot of people are, are too worried about what the person next to them is doing, right? Oh, why do you give this person a raise? It's for most well, you know, like, like, like they say, worry about yourself, right? Improve yourself, you know, learn new skills, right? Maybe this ain't the place for you. Learn new skills and go somewhere else where they, where they value you. Too many people complaining, I think, about the other person. So I never got that experience because uh, for whatever reason, I was always promoted without asking. So I was all, I always got, and plus I'm from the culture where, it is kind of proud upon to advertise yourself. You know, if you in Ukraine, you try to advertise, market yourself, right? Or whatever, it, it, it's a good thing here. In Ukraine, they look at you a little bit, you know, they, they almost kind of uh, punish you for that uh, back in the days. So I don't know how is it now. But uh, yeah, a lot of people from Eastern Europe, they actually uh, feel that it's kind of like beneath, not, not beneath, but so to speak, it's not a common thing to even ask for rings, you know, because it would consider to be self-promoting or you didn't deserve. And, um, and another kind of uh, discovery that I made is that in Ukraine, if you're a student, you're at this level. If you're a teacher, you're 10 levels above, right? So there's a separation of, of roles. Uh, same thing for employee manager. In the U.S., it's almost, you're almost on the same level. So your manager is almost your friend. He's just one level above you type of thing. In Ukraine, we have a much greater distance. So in China, I know all these cultures where you have, I forgot what's the word for it. I actually learned that at the university, but a huge separation. So for that reason, to ask for promotion, for us to ask, why am I getting paid? That would, in Ukraine, you wouldn't do that. And here, it's okay to do that. Demand, you know, for your rights, uh, ask for equal pay. In Ukraine, it's like, oh, well, I kind of deserve it. So I'm going to keep shot, you know, so to speak. Okay. So you were the, President of the Association of Latino Professionals. 
Like, how did that come about? Because not only are you not a white guy from America, you a white guy from a whole different country, right? Yeah, so I call it being minority within the minority. So I um, just, I spent two years uh, trying to save, save up some money uh, so I could pay for the university. Then I moved to Miami, and guess what? Everybody speaks Spanish there. And what, what college was this? Uh, so there's Florida International University. It's one of the largest uh, public uh, universities in America. Uh, they have uh, Miami Dade College, which which is the largest community college, with it, which is a feeder school for this one. 50,000 or 55,000 students there. 98% uh, of them bilingual. Uh, Florida International University. Um, when I uh, so in Ukraine, I studied electrical electrical engineering. I actually left one month before my graduation, so I did not complete my degree. If I did, I wouldn't be able to come here. So that's another kind of an interesting twist to my story. So I still wanted to complete my education. Always wanted to study business in Ukraine, study electrical engineering, because there's a, a common thing to graduate with dual degree, one in technical discipline, one in business. So by the end of the year five, I would have two masters. So that didn't happen because I left on the year four. So here I wanted to continue started to study the electrical engineer, but then figure out, oh, too much to relearn. So I switched to finance. The first semester in finance, they tell you like, well, we're gonna give you general education. Well, guess what? 2000 of you are gonna graduate on the same day. You gotta differentiate yourself somehow. You gotta join this business organizations. We had to, uh, it's called Alpha, misspelled Alpha, AL. So that would stand for Association of Latino Professionals in Finance and Accounting. And it was beta uh, for this business fraternity. So I joined, I didn't know which one to go to. And so I just followed the previous girl, went there and they said like, well, listen, if you get a, if you become uh, an executive of this uh, association, you have a much higher chances of getting the job. So at that time I still had a fear of being poor. So I figured like, well, this is my way to, to survival. So I'm gonna get good education. I didn't know about rankings. I didn't know that uh, school is important. So I figured I'll do that. But, and then they tell me like, well, no, school is not gonna give you anything. So you gotta do something different. So I just said, okay, I'll do this uh, thing. And you had to essentially run the political campaign. You people had to vote for you and things like that. So I didn't know who do I want to be. I, mean, I didn't want to be a VP. I didn't want to be a secretary. I'll just go for a president. So I actually ran against the guy from Lebanon. So there was Ukrainian and Lebanese guy, uh, both trying to run for a president. Why? Because it was one year long commitment versus six months long commitment. It was a lot of work. Nobody wanted to do work. They just wanted the benefit. So uh, when I became a president, I, my jaw dropped. Um, I quit the job. I loved it. I did it 40 hours per week or more. And that's all I did pretty much. I loved it so much. Grew my executive board from 12 people to 27, started two more organizations and things like that. So then we went to a convention where also employers come in, try to recruit diversity. So uh, Microsoft folks came there. Um, other people, JP Morgan Chase, some equity funds and things like that. Uh, they came in to look for Latino to fulfill that, you know, uh, uh, canvas spot. You know, we want to be diverse, so let us hire, you know, one black, one Latino, one this. So where do we go? We go to the largest student convention, which happened to be this alpha convention. And uh, I met this person. Uh, she was just very nice. Uh, her name was Rosanna. I didn't know who she was. She happened to be chief of staff for the CFO. I had no idea who she was until I finished my last interview. So I had no idea. So she liked me. She said, where's your resume? And I said, oh, I just made a mistake there. I said, my graduation year was, uh, instead of 2012, there was 2012. 20, so I'm not even passing on resumes. I'm trying to place my students. I had 400 members. We brought uh, 55 of those and they, oh, they all got jobs. So I was like, you know, babysitting them and trying to introduce them. So I came to Microsoft to ask them what kind of offers they have so I can send them the right students. And essentially the question was, what are you looking for? I was like, yeah, I don't know, some finance. So I was supposed to be at Bank of America, by the way. Yeah, they love me. They like invited me and everything. So, and then uh, they said, well, consider Microsoft. I'm like, okay, sure. And uh, that's, that's how it happened. So I had seven interviews. By the end of the seven interview, I got the job, essentially. So you moved from Miami to Seattle. Yep. And that, that's probably a bigger culture shock than to go from Ukraine to United States. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, so, um, but again, uh, by that time, I used to move every six months from one apartment to another, from New Jersey to Philadelphia, then to Miami, then you know, I end up in Ohio at some point. So yeah, it was uh, quite a quite a jump uh, all over the place, right? Uh, so I'm used to that. Uh, I like being flexible. You know, the agility is my strength. So uh, when I came to Microsoft, for example, they three months later they said, "Well, we announced restructuring." 
and everybody was so panicky and like why it's all good just another change so what everybody was stressful uh, everybody was stressed but me you know because i'm so used to this i'm so used to that um, so as the president of the uh, latino association can you talk about how how improved your leadership skills so um we spoke so the, the point of that organization was to essentially find jobs for all the members and uh, we would invite an, uh, two employers every week uh, one for finance and one for accounting that could be bank of america and that could be jp uh, morgan chase and then for accounting that would be deloitte and all this stuff and we would listen to what they're looking for you know what kind of students they they, they would require they would all essentially say we need some technical skills and soft skills technical skills soft skills I'm like oh what does that mean they said, well, at least we need to know you. We need you to know Excel. I'm like, okay, so what does a soft skill mean? Well, we need you to write well, speak well. I'm like, oh, okay. So I started a tech club and we were essentially teaching Excel. The idea was I will give you, you know, this kind of exercise, you come prepared and you teach me Excel. So I will sit on the back and I will learn how the students would teach me. It happened to be the other way around. I had to teach Excel. So I ended up learning Excel on my own. Then I started a chapter of Toastmasters. We became, um, so we landed in the less than 2% of the clubs in the world. We were present distinguished in seven months. That's what uh, less than 2% of the clubs in the world achieve uh, because we had meetings for two times. Anyways, we had coaches. We had uh, very, very good trainers, and they did that. At that time, I barely spoke English. I had to learn Spanish a tiny bit, right? And then I was doing public speaking presentation two times, three times per week in the front of 200, 400 students at a, at the, at a time. Plus, uh, I managed people, right? I was a terrible manager, learned all my manager, made all managerial mistakes in the book doing that. Uh, great experience. Uh, I was terrible, but I've learned. And um, essentially developed by accident, you know. So now when I read managerial books, like, oh, I've done that mistake. Oh, I've done that. It's really, really helpful. Uh, so I don't know if I was a good leader at that time. I made a lot of bad choices, bad decisions that led to good outcomes, Right. But uh, it was, I mean, it was intentional to start an organization. The way I did it was kind of bad. But I did some great things. I, I realized what people were motivated by. Uh, so this is- that, That's so big. So many managers yeah. don't do that. Yeah, so I, and that's how I was able to achieve that. So we were giving titles to people. We were giving recognition. We were setting up uh, them with the job interviews. So we would give them every possibility. So when we knew clearly what their goal was, we achieved that. And uh, essentially 400 students that, that our organization was 200. By the end of uh, my term, it was 400. We doubled that. So we killed the competitor organization, even though we still like them. And you doubled in this one year, right? Yeah. Wow. yeah. In one year, we doubled. And that was about 2,000 students in the whole program at the same time. So 400 members, that means that throughout the four-year uh, education, every, essentially everybody would, do, would somehow pass uh, uh, through our organization. And then uh, because of that, uh, other organization arrived. So we have Florida International University is not on the Ivy League school list, but we have some of the best education. We have professors from Harvard. They go to Florida on vacation for a couple of years, right? And they end up teaching there. Then we have organizations and students learn on their own. So the official degree doesn't give you much, but the opportunities you get there. This is how uh, our students end up in private equity firms, you know, beating the Ivy League schools. And then when I came to Microsoft, I was beating everybody on Excel. I was beating everybody on a lot of other things except self-promotion. That's what we didn't get. That's what we didn't get. Uh, culturally speaking, my culture. And uh, also FIU doesn't beat you up like, oh, you're the best in the world, like Harvard does, right? So that, those are a couple of things that I didn't learn until later. So when you went from Miami to Seattle, is it safe to presume that you drove? Uh, no, uh, my sister and I, we flew uh, to LA and then we got uh, a car and we drove. So we did a trip, you know, we explored the area and then uh, we landed here. So it was an ex exploration trip, essentially. Uh, Microsoft gave this relocation money that it was actually a trip. Why not? Yeah, spend so, the money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so talk some about never having to apply for a job. I think this is, this is key because like I tell people all the time, like when people try to find a job, well, first let me backtrack. Like a lot of people are trying to find a job now, right? I tell people it's never easy to find a job. You know, it's always hard. It's always hard. And then people like they'll, they'll send a thousand resumes out and you yeah. try to tell them they're wasting their job, I'm wasting their time. I mean, like I realize, you know, if you send a thousand resumes out, it feels good. You're doing something, but you're really not right. It, it keeps networking. So can you talk about how you 
get all these jobs without even applying for it. So networking is great, but let's say I take Microsoft as a case, right? Uh, I didn't. The network was the networking was very short, so I just met a people, uh, met a person, and then you know, the, uh, I did submit my resume after the fact. So you know, just for the official check mark, uh, I think. So here's uh, my approach to all this thing. It's um, so now I'm in business, and when people apply for a job to work with me now, they submit a proposal, right? They said, "This is what I can do for you." So a similar concept. Right now, you're kind of, if you're applying for a job, you're sort of like asking, hey, pay me money and I will do whatever you ask me to do. So you still tell them, uh, give me the job, tell me what to do and I will do it. Versus if I come into you with the ideas, with the, some of it's like, hey, I can do this for you, I can do that for you. Then it becomes almost like an ROI conversation. It's like, oh, okay, so you have this idea and then in your head, you know, your space, like that doesn't apply, but I like your enthusiasm. So I, if you brought these ideas, I believe, and when I, when, when I get you on board, you will do something similar and you will pay off for that salary. So um, when I did run this organization, Alpha, I talked to a lot of recruiters and I also realized that they are managing risk. So you're in a charge space. You're essentially managing your own risk. So it, your fears, right? My fear is like, oh, I'm trying to get a job and get this or whatever. I fear of being rejected. Your, uh, your risk, your fear, is like what if I get the wrong candidate to my customer, to Microsoft? They hate the candidate. They will assume that I, because I sent them that candidate, they will assume that I'm doing a bad job. Therefore, my mistake with one candidate may cost me business, right? So you have to prove to HR that you are a safe candidate, that you are delivering more value than you're going to get paid for, right? So that, that's one thing. Uh, then resumes and all of these things. Uh, I don't follow the uh, traditional route. If they tell you get education, get an internship, always try to... Um, to see how you can differentiate. What's your unique value proposition, so to speak, right? Uh, some skills that, uh, so I, at Microsoft, I, you know, I used, to, I used to be a part of a 20 people, highly selective uh, finance rotational program. So there were a couple spots for diversity. I think that's what I took. Although I don't think uh, that was the reason um, in general, but this was initially how I came across these things, right? Um, and I'm kind of getting, you know, all over the place. But the point is, if you don't want to apply for the job, figure out how to, if you are a business, figure out how to submit a proposal, right? What you can do uh, for the business in the river. So try to switch uh, things. So let's say if you want a job for $100,000, prove it, you know, just say like, this is what I can do for $100,000 pay. I can deliver you $500,000 value. So pay me $100,000 or I can do this. And then your mindset will change. Uh, everything will change. So when you network, when you introduce yourself, don't introduce yourself, I'm a corporate finance, whatever manager. They introduce like yourself saying like, this is what I do. You know, I help do this, I help do that. Or uh, I'm working on the, well, we open a new cafe, so are we doing this? Or I manage uh, anything that would translate into value. Then I will uh, do the job for myself. Uh, oh, maybe I need this for my company and therefore I will pay you. Or come and talk to me and I will, uh, I will, uh, will figure out what you can do for me. So that's kind of my approach. This is uh, how, uh, and also seek to understand. With Microsoft, I came in, I didn't ask what job do you have. I asked what people are you looking for? Uh, describe me your best people. What are their profile? Uh, let me see if I, can, if I know someone who matches your profile. So I was trying to actually help them to find the right people uh, before I even offer myself to them. All right, so that was, that's my approach. You bring up some good points. Like I think most people have an attitude of, so keep on talking. So I got to turn the, my camera turns off for 30 minutes. I got to turn it sure. back on real fast. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the interview process. That, that's actually a, a kind of a funny story. Uh, so if you, uh, if you want my, if you want to know my secret at uh, nailing every interview, uh, so to speak, uh, not every interview, but it, to increase your chances of getting a job. So uh, a typical interview would be like, introduce yourself, do this, uh, tell me what you've done, that kind of thing. And then it will be the end of interview. And the end of the interview is the most valuable part for me personally, because this is when you get to ask questions. And uh, when you're a student, you're kind of afraid to ask questions. Like, give me any job because I know you're going to pay me. So I will do whatever you want. I will bend my personality. I will bend myself. I will change whatever this stuff is. Now I'm different, right? Now I'm asking all these questions about the culture and what you do, because I don't want to bend if it doesn't, uh, 
if if I don't see it reasonable, right? I can adjust, but if you want to bend my personality, maybe that's not the right spot for me. So uh, when you ask questions, uh, you have to ask questions that are valuable. So question, tell me about your culture is meaningless, right? Uh, tell me uh, how many people you promoted and for what brings me a lot more value. Uh, describe me a, a, a top performer tells me a lot about what you're looking for. You know, if I ask you who you're looking for, oh, we're looking, everybody's looking for energetic, smart, overqualified people, aka overqualified people. And by, what are they going to tell you, right? So, uh, uh, Mike, uh, the way you, put, you, you, you present these questions, it's supposed to give you information. So let's say if I ask you, describe me the best person in your organization, describe me the last person you promoted. What did they do? What kind of project they worked on? What qualities they had? So then uh, the person would describe, and usually uh, it starts with HR and then it's a manager or some, of some sort, right? So you get uh, different flavors. And then they tell you, well, this person um, didn't ask for it. They just came up with this project on their own and then they, they, they went through to build the team and then they were like, oh, it's great that you mentioned that. That's exactly what I did when I was the president. E exactly, of yeah, you gotta you know, tie it in, and, yeah. And then you just match those two profiles and then they leave the interview remembering the first thing and remember the last thing. So what do they remember? Is that I'm trying to fit in the profile, not just an average person. I'm trying to match the best person uh, in that profile. Again, uh, w without faking it, right? Because when I was a student, I could fake it because I just wanted any job. Now I'm not even going to fake it. So if it doesn't match me, if, uh, so that's the reason I don't work for Amazon. Because if you tell me uh, the last person who got promoted worked there 24 seven, and that's how they got promoted. I'm like, well, this is stupid. So I don't, in my philosophy, uh, my philosophy is to work smart. So if I can work for five hours a day, I will do that. If I can work for three hours per day, I will do that because it allows me to create those ideas for a next billion dollar business, right? That's just my personality, what I bring to the table. Uh, I bring completely outside of the box, new business ideas and all this stuff. I need time for that. And I'm not a grind person. So if, and on the interview, if you tell me that, I will say, well, good luck. You know, I'm just not gonna waste your time. At that time, I would tell her like, oh yeah, we'll work 25 hours per week, right? But that wouldn't be uh, the case now. Could have been yeah, the case. Yeah, before. people don't realize you gotta, you gotta ask questions at any of you. You gotta know, are you gonna be a match for that company? Yeah. And, and there's so many things you gotta do. Like you gotta, like you said, ask questions that are gonna set you for success. Like maybe ask, you know, the person you hire, what, what kind of challenges you have? Well, the challenge X, Y, Z, oh, what a coincidence. I just yeah. did the same things and you know, just set yourself for success. And going back on another thing we're talking about, I think there's a big disconnect. A lot of people, I think they get a job. Oh, the job's paying sixty thousand. I'm only going to do enough for sixty thousand dollars worth of work, right? Not realizing the company when they hire hire you at sixty thousand, they're expecting at least hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of value, right? They're expecting yeah. they're not hiring to pay the money. You know, they're expecting some kind of value, some kind of ROI to improve improve the company, right? I, I just don't think a lot of people realize that, you know. So. Um I have a lot of uh, thoughts on this process. So at Microsoft, like I, I did every possible job in finance, including people's compensation, and I've designed sales plans as well. So I have a lot of take on this, but uh, I'll try to make it short. So um, first of all, let me just finish the last point about the interviews. When you're already on the interview, that's too late. If you're trying to apply for a job and Very get a job, point. that's too late on the interview. You start your job process with the coffee chat. You know, with the whatever it is. So if I, if I'm a, I have a business now. I have to market my products. My products are expensive. I, you know, when you, when I get you on the phone, this is not what I sell. I sell you know, in marketing. We know about nurturing sequence, right? Why don't you do the same thing for a job? Especially if you apply for a business role, business function, you do learn basics of marketing. You do learn basics of whatever, right? Business, how how it's, uh, how stuff gets sold. So why do you expect to have one interview or one day interviews, even if there are seven interviews? How do you expect, expect to sell yourself during that time? So people do research on you, LinkedIn and all that, but that's a cold prospect, right? If you're LinkedIn, my LinkedIn is terrible. I'm not, it's not optimized for looking for jobs, right? But if I wanted to, I would put articles, I would put this, I would reach out to people, I would do all of this to self-promote myself to the point when again, I wouldn't be looking for a job, the job would be looking for me. Right, if that was my purpose. Unfortunately, when you go through school system, uh, it, you know, they never teach you any of that stuff. They teach you Excel, they don't teach you how to literally sell yourself to in order to get a project, a job, a business, right? So they don't do that. 
So now kind of going back to um, uh, value proposition and all this stuff. Every business, it's just common business sense. If you pay more than you receive, it's not a viable product. And for even Microsoft or not, doesn't matter. Uh, money is a finite resource. So nobody's gonna pay you for delivering the work. Microsoft or big companies, they have a luxury of overpaying you and then attributing success of others to you. So if you're a director level role, GM, you can be making half a million bucks, but you have not, you know, you're sending emails. So essentially every email you send, it's thousand dollars, right? Uh, every Excel spreadsheet you send like two grand. So that's what I did, right? Because if, we, if I look at my deliverables, wow, this report just cost company $3,000. Yeah, sure, it was a forecast, you know, it was a, and a lot of things, but uh, I didn't see it. If I don't believe in myself, if I, if I don't believe that my product costs $3,000, how are you going to prove to your employer that you worked that much money, right? So that's why you have to do something different. You have to offer that value. So I did sales presentations that were part of my, not my job when I already got in. So another mistake that people make, they think they got in and that's it, the job is done. You won. And that's it, you got your salary. And it's, it's just the beginning of the process. The first 90 days, the first couple of years, you know, when you build your reputation that you can later uh, you know, reap the benefits of. But a lot of times, especially people that get first jobs, they just forget about the fact that this is just the beginning. You know? And then they figure out, oh, I finished, I graduated, so I don't have to study anymore. I don't have to learn anything. And um, therefore, your value is not improving, but you want more money. But you're not learning more. You're not delivering more. And you only deliver as much as you ask. Well, I should get, I, I've been here for three years. I should, get a, I should get a raise every year, right? Exactly. Isn't that how it's supposed to work in America? Exactly. So and that's why I kind of think that everybody should run their business at some point in time because then they would understand. When you start hiring people, then you understand what the pain is and how to actually. So I know both sides. That's why for me it's very easy to get a job because if I apply for a job, I know that I would be uh, making more for the, for the company. Therefore, my mindset is different. I'm not a beggar. I'm offering you know, my services to you versus the other way around. So it's a, you know, we're talking about, uh, we, are, we are here during the times of coronavirus and the la massive layoffs and everything. So um, funny story, I laid off myself from Microsoft. So four years later, I, uh, my job was in finance. Part of my job is to read between the lines. I knew that the restructuring was happening. So I led myself to a layoff. Here's why. I did three jobs in one, you know, the just lucky situation that I had. My, uh, my partner went on maternity leave and then my director left. Uh, so I, uh, in effect, I did three jobs. They were not three jobs fully, but I realized that CFO is asking for something, trickles down to GM, GM trickles down to director, then this, and then I do the job. So when they were not in the picture, I just did the work. So the same amount of work was done without having extra people on it. Maybe not three jobs, maybe it was two and a half, but I had this unique experience of doing very high level jobs that would take me 15 years to do. And then uh, I was able to do it for six months to a year. It depends on how you look at it. So then when the layoffs were coming, they hired a guy uh, whose greatest experience. I asked him a question, what was your greatest achievement in the past? And he said, I laid off 3,000 people from Nokia. So I looked around like, okay, I know why you're here, right? It's just common sense. Yeah. There's a yeah. reason he's there, yeah. Yeah, I asked a lot of, uh, so I'm known at Microsoft for asking very juicy questions. I can, I can tell a couple more of those. Anyways, so I knew that was coming. Why did I want to lay off so badly? It is because when you're in a reactive state, which means at Microsoft, they take care of people. So they would place me on a role that I wouldn't want, right? Uh, I wouldn't apply. I wouldn't interview managers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't network. They would just say like, hey, do you want a job? Here's, here's a role for you. Well, you don't want it. And a lot of people still take it because it's still six-figure jobs. At that point, I was suffering. Because I have all these ideas. They hired me as a, you know, this unique thinker. Like, okay, bring us all those ideas. In fact, they said, well, we don't want your ideas. We want to mold you so you think like us. I was already suffering by that time. Plus, a lot of companies do packages. So I got three months worth of uh, pay to start my own business. I call it startup capital, essentially. So I was the happiest person. Actually, I made a post on LinkedIn. I got like 140,000 likes for that post when I left the company. You know, just because of how much positivity I had about the whole process. So I think that people look at it very wrong. Uh, HR was in so much shock. She's like, do you understand what's going on? We're giving you the, pay. you know, essentially you don't have a job. I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it quick because I got to go upstairs and I got to finish the journal entries because if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it and it's going to be messed up. Like, you don't have to do any work. Uh, so they left me, they let me keep my computer for a week after I left. 
I had access to the entire company's finances because of my different roles. I essentially had access to literally everything. They let me keep my laptop for a week, right? So that, that kind of speaks for the amount of trust they had because I, I wasn't crazy or anything like that. So that's kind of delivering value, right? Uh, I automated reports, I fired vendors, I did all of these things without asking for too much permission uh, to do so. Uh, that was a good and that was a bad because sometimes managers do like to be uh, you know, reported and, and, and done all these things. So I had this unique opportunity to run my own show and then that opportunity would end soon. So that's why I decided to leave. And uh, in order to leave gracefully, I asked for a layoff. So I saved the... Uh, you know, somebody else's spot potentially. Plus I got myself a startup bonus that allowed me to start my own company. So uh, all, all these things happening and uh, that's because of my luck. I feel lucky about these things. Yeah, so you left Microsoft and why did you decide to become an entrepreneur? Um, because- Did you, uh, what do you backtrack? Were you already thinking about becoming an entrepreneur in between or even before all the layoffs came or did the layoffs trigger you want to become an entrepreneur? So when you grow up in Ukraine, no, if you have a job in Ukraine, you would be making two hundred, four hundred, six hundred dollars a month. Uh, nobody essentially is thinking that the job. So even though I had a fear of being poor, but nobody would plan to have a job because that would be a suicidal mission. So I was entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mind. I had entrepreneurial mindset for my entire life. But when I came here to the U.S., it was different. I was put in a position when I had to react. You have to pay rent, therefore you have to have a, have a job. So I was paycheck to paycheck for many, many years, right? So there's a difference between being in a reactive state and, uh, and managing your life uh, uh, proactively. So even at Microsoft, I was in the reactive state. So essentially I reassessed the risk. So what, what, what do you think? You know, they say entrepreneurs, they take a risk. Who do you think takes more risk, a corporate employee or entrepreneur? Good, that's a good question. Like I say all the time, like people will talk about entrepreneurs and those security. Well, corporate yeah. people don't have that much security either. They have none. So imagine, you know, I mean, it sounds crazy, but just think about this for a moment, right? Uh, do you control how much you make? No. To, maybe to a certain extent, yeah, market, whatever, right? Uh, do you control what you do? You, you may think so, right? But no, you have somebody tell you what you can or cannot do. Uh, are you in charge of your promotions? Of course not. Are you in charge of even your, let's talk about time. Can you legitimately tell me if you are free to choose the time in a day you work? Most of the time not. Exactly. So, okay, you have no freedoms, right? But let's talk about the risks. Do you know when your job is going to end or do you have a feeling that, oh, it's like in Japan, you know, I got this job and it's going to be with me for the rest of my life, right? It has an end, right? And you never know when it's going to end. Nobody is going to give you visibility to anything, essentially. You never know what's cooking. And uh, I was put in a situation when, because of this kind of unique situation, I also had to do payroll, uh, uh, not a payroll, uh, forecast for people. How many people are we going to hire or not? So I was put in a position when I look ac uh, across the table and I had a 30 people team and I knew I'm putting on my spreadsheet that some of you is going to go, you know, and they don't know. And they're happy, they smile, they, they buy homes and they pay mortgages and they make life plans. And they don't know that somebody's already uh, have a plan for them, right? So I call that a risk. When you run your own business, and by the way, I don't call myself an entrepreneur. I, I, it's just a business. I'm a, just a businessman. I did define opportunity, making a business plan. If the revenue and profits are higher than my expenses, that's a business plan. So I, it's not a risk. You do take a risk, calculate a risk. You trust your partners. You pay money. You expect them to deliver. So yeah, you have risk. You hire a person expecting them to deliver. You hire a person expecting them not to steal and all this stuff. There's a lot of risks, right? But at least you're managing your risk, right? What's happening to you. Uh, so I call it, um, the way I see it, I have less risk there. If you talk about the money, um, I, you know, I live in value and all this stuff. I don't know anybody. Uh, and Microsoft, it kind of gives you a wrong impression uh, because sometimes when you work at Microsoft, you can still buy a million dollar home, right? But it's a wrong impression. This is uh, almost anomaly. If you look in the United States overall, right? Employees don't buy million dollar homes. Employees don't, right? Not usually. Not usually. Unless you're a, like a, a football player of the Dallas Cowboys or Seattle Houston Seahawks, an employer like that, exactly. you know, but most no average person know. Exactly. So, so for those reasons, plus I started getting coaching. I started doing, the, you know, self work. I started investing in myself. Uh, even when I worked at Microsoft, I took all these trainings, this, this, and that. I'm like, you're training me 
to become a better employee for you. And I start reading between the lines and I understood what they are doing, right? Essentially, when you spend a certain amount of time in finance, for example, you become enabled. Uh, so your muscles kind of become amorphous. You cannot do anything on your own after that. So you start developing fear that if you lose Microsoft job, you are not going to be able to find another one. And you know, Microsoft, uh, Amazon doesn't like employees from Microsoft, right? Yeah. You're in HR, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like, 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 yeah. They call it different culture. But uh, I mean, whatever you want to call it. My point is, you are at risk. If you spend 10 years at one company, you feel that you're lucky, right? Because they kind of appreciate you. But then I come in uh, freshly out of college, so to speak, right? Even though I had a lot of experience in the past, but I'm technically fresh out of college and I can do the job that would take you 15 years to, to get to. So when I did that, I was like, what the heck? How am I going to do it when I'm 15 years ahead and some young college kid comes in, automates every reporting, every, every analysis possible? And now what am I going to do? How am I going to defend my half a million dollar salary? Right? So I call that a risk. Or even like people don't realize you, you have a great job, you have a great boss, but your boss gets promoted. They bring a new boss in that doesn't know you and yeah. you and the new boss don't get along. Right? Yeah. So there are ways to play it. Right. And I'm assuming that's what they teach you at Ivy league schools. I, I, I guess so. Right. I, how to play the system, how to network and, and uh, network within the company and, 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 you know, prevent these, uh, preempt these things and, and uh, kind of make a plan A, B, C and all these things. That, that's all great. So if you play corporate uh, game, you can't do it. You just got to do it smart because a lot of people become complacent the minute they get a job. And then they think, uh, my mistake, I thought that the way to success is to actually do the job right. So that's what I did. I wouldn't leave the office. I wouldn't talk to people. And then, you know, my, uh, there's 20 people in my highly selective rotation program. I'm like, they're never in the office. I'm like, what are you doing? Are you drinking coffees and everything? You do uh, arguably less quality job and they got promoted. I'm like, why? What am I doing wrong? You know, so then I figured it out. So some people do know how to play corporate. I just didn't know. I didn't know how to do that. I, I wanted more control of what I do. So I left Microsoft, my six-figure job to make zero. Actually, no, not to make zero, to make negative amount of money. The next, the following year, I made... Um, $17,000 or so, right? This year, I, I'm about to close $750,000 in revenue, right? Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm not talking about profits is because my mindset also changed. I'm putting money back in the business. I take as much as I need, which I realized that you didn't need much. And even though I make a lot of money, now I'm like Amazon. I'm trying to pay less taxes and reinvest in business. So I'm building the machine now, right? The money-making machine. But for the first couple of years, essentially, you go bankrupt, the uh, type of thing. So that's craziness, right? So that's what I think that's what they call it, entrepreneurship and all these things. But I didn't feel that I'm making zero or like negative or $17,000 because I'm building a business. My business at that time was valued at $100,000 based on the metrics, comparables, whatever the stuff is, right? So I didn't make zero. I made $100,000 on paper. The next year was a $300,000, right? It was still on paper. This year, it's not even on paper. It's literally in hard cash, right, that I, that I can make money. But not everybody has the long, uh, long-term long vision like that, right? They think, oh, I need cash. I need to pay my rent. I need to do all these things. You're in a reactive state again, you know. So many people are. Can you talk some more about your company and what it does and how it came about? So I had a lot of ideas on what to do. Uh, I wanted to be in, in Microsoft when I was in finance role. I realized that there are two types of roles, uh, essentially value added roles and support roles. Uh, at my graduation, my uh, manager asked me to write a couple, uh, two learnings that I had in two years of from the, coming out of the program. And I said, finance is a support function, is a support organization. And uh, she replied, she said, well, it kind of has negative connotation. Can you come up with something different? And I said, why does it have negative connotation? It's just my major learning. So imagine uh, these companies, they can hire the best snipers. One shot, one kill, right? And I'm sorry to bring this like a military example. One shot, one kill, the highest efficiency possible. So they hire this as snipers. They, everybody comes in and they say, well, now do the job, win the war. But snipers don't win the war. You need somebody to gather intelligence. You need somebody to uh, run and shoot, right? But you also need somebody to cook food, to prepare the ammunition, 
to do all of these things. And, so, and, and even to go you know, take a step further, someone has to make the bullet, right? Someone has to make the gun. Exactly. exactly. Someone has to you know, do logistics to supply chain to get the weapons and bullets to where they got to be. Yeah, it's, yeah, so there's this famous example uh, during the, by the end of the Second World War II when Russians were chasing Germans uh, back to Germany. They got so far ahead that their support troops uh, didn't make it on time and they lost, right? So there's uh, one of the last battles. So if, if they say if the support function was able to catch up, now the world could have been different, right? Uh, if they were able to, if Russians were able to uh, take out the Germany without help from, uh, uh, from anybody else, it could have been a different world only because of the support function. It's not good or bad, it just is, right? Finance is a support function, but I wanted to be on the front line. I wanted to... Uh, get wounded, but I wanted to get reward for that. In accounting, you get rewarded if you make zero errors, but it's hard to justify. In finance, how do you get, you know, it's not you making sales, you're just making projections, uh, compensation, and all this stuff. You're still paper pusher, right? Uh, generally, speaking, there's a lot of power in finance, a lot. So without proper numbers, you don't go anywhere. But I wanted to be on the front line, just my personality, my fit. So I wanted to do marketing or sales. Look at my resume, I did the SWOT analysis myself, doesn't have anything to do with it. So I figured, you know what, I'll start my own company and I will prove that I can build a product, market it, sell it, and build a successful business. I had uh, 25 different ideas what to do for a marketing agency, but I felt like I'm a fraud. If I never had a client, how would I sell my services? So like, I'll start small. So um, I was looking for something for my niece, uh, couldn't find uh, what I was looking for, find this product. Um, it's an indoor jungle gym that I used to have when I was growing up. And I did research, found a manufacturer, was amazed about the margins, about the product, to check the boxes essentially. So I did all the research about the, what a successful business can be. And I decided, well, uh, I don't care what to run. Uh, I like this. I, I grew up with this. So I, I, I have a little bit of passion for it. I love educational space. I like the impact because if you make an impact on the kids, you carry that impact for the rest of their life. So if it's a development of motor skills, psychology, all of this stuff. So I felt great about it. And I decided I'll just build a business that will be a stepping stone to my next business. So that, that's how I switched from an idea to build software. Uh, that's the original name, Brain Rich, uh, was for a software company. I switched it to uh, being a kid's company. Uh, and now we do uh, indoor jungle gyms for kids. Uh, part of the reason why we do so great is because everybody's at home and uh, kids as well. Uh, if you work at home and uh, your kids are around, my stuff is helping you to make your life easier. So a lot easier. So I'm solving a big problem, especially right that's, now. That's kind of a big pivot from software to jungle gyms. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I have a business background, which means, so uh, in my personal theory, everybody has to specialize in something. So if you're a software developer, you have to be good at this security expert, HR, you know, you have to know people, you have to know software tools in finance, in business function. I couldn't understand what it was. And then I, I figured it out. So I have to be a specialist on gathering resources together, right? Putting the resources, people, idea, execution, boom, business, build, done, ship, right? So that's my, my, my expertise, which I was not getting. I was not developing that expertise when I was at Microsoft making six figures, right? My expertise, my, my uh, development in that area was kind of declining. I was not able to pull resources. You leave the company, you have no marketing department, no lawyers, no nothing. You're on your own and you have to pay for everything. So I used to have $20 million marketing budget, went down to zero. I have to be very creative on how I do it, right? So now I'm helping autistic kids. I, have, I don't have any autistic kids in my family. I don't know anything. So I had to learn about a completely new audience that greatly benefits from my product. And I have to do, you know, kind of uh, come to this, um, uh, to every problem like this. I don't even have kids. Right, so I sell kids' product. So that opens my mind to accepting ideas, uh, opinions, and all this thing. So, so how do you make your product? Um, it's manufactured in Russia. So I uh, designed, so I, I studied electrical engineering. So I'm not afraid of a yeah. technical problem. I understand everything. They were in, in Russia, they have a factory of 150 people. They restructured the whole plant and the whole plant because of what I told them to do. They had 13 models for different colors for each, just to give an idea. Right, uh, how, it, there were a lot of inefficiencies. So now they're making twice more money than they used to make. Uh, before we started, the, I call it like free consulting project, right? Uh, that I did for them because it was benefiting me as well. So I have my own brand, I have my own uh, dedicated uh, people in Russia that do it. Uh, I have people here in the U.S. that help me to sell. Uh, I do a lot of work still to the to date. 
So there's a lot of things that I know that I need to get done and I'm, I'm not perfect from, from far from it. So a lot of things need to be done, but my graphs, you know, this is a graph for last year, but, you know, and now this graph is like a rocket launch. You know, I don't even know like, how is it possible? But uh, that's why I invest a little bit on stock market, but like, I'm not getting any returns like that on the stock market. Uh, so is your product for a certain age kit? Uh, yeah, it holds uh, 220 pounds. So a positioning, it was a position exercise. It was made for adults. So if you're under 220 pounds, you can use it, but uh, it's for kids. It's painted in bright colors. Uh, it's marketed for kids. I don't want to compete with the big guys, you know, like uh, people that, uh, companies that make uh, gym equipment. So I'm flying out under, under the radar of uh, bigger companies. So I virtually have no competition. Yeah, I do, but uh, it's more of a substitute product. It's more of a you know, pricing category kind of com uh, competition, but not head to head competition with a big company. So how do people uh, find your company? Are you doing marketing, just word of mouth or just organically? So I'm sort of lucky. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there's a lot of missed opportunities. So I'm constantly out of stock. So I try not to, I spend zero on, on ads right now. Um, it's more word of the mouth. It's, I build a momentum. I over serviced my initial call, call and I still answer calls. If somebody calls for customer service support, I have higher project, my uh, higher profit margin uh, product. So I, I can afford to take a call and essentially uh, do all that. And people are just blown away with the service. So that's why even if the uh, big guys compete with me, they will never be able to compete with the quality of service that I provide. And that's what they like. So uh, I have a lot of marketing strategies, how I do it. Facebook groups work for me. You know, uh, all of this uh, is literally, it's just for my business, that's what works. If people hang out on Facebook, I go there. If they hang out in uh, uh, someplace else, I would go there. But they are on Facebook groups. They trust other parents' opinion, and that's what I do. I give them all the tools, all the support. And, you know, are your customers mainly like, like, like families or are it also schools also? Uh, both, but a lot of individuals. Uh, so a lot of... Uh, so autistic families, uh, families with the kids with autism, they're a very tight community, essentially. When, when you, God forbid, have a kid with the disabilities, you don't know where to go. So they, they, they seek each other. And once the word gets out, it's, it's out. You know, that there's something that is really helping that it's out. So um, that's why it's kind of like me looking for a job, right? I'm trying to deliver $500,000 value, $1 million value, and I'm only asking for $100,000 pay. Same thing here. My product is only like $500, but it gives you so much more value. So I make it very easy for them to buy, even though it's expensive, but the benefit is just tremendous. So that's what I'm trying to uh, prove. And our customers, they were like, the, like is, is the product the same? Our customers say, I want a blue one, a red one. I want this change, that change. It's all like the same product. Um, there are variations. So I build it in the form of Lego uh, it, 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 with the concept of Lego, where you can start small and kind of build add on and things like that. So this is where I did a little bit of uh, engineering of how you sell. Uh, originally, I didn't have that ability to sell something cheaper and then add on and then this and on and upsell and downsell. I didn't have that ability. Now I do. So I give you ability to start small and build and build and build and expand and uh, get it uh, bigger, better uh, in all, all aspects. So make it bigger for fun or make it bigger for uh, more benefits for kids. So I sell pretty much... Um, still limited colors only two colors not four anymore and people are understanding uh you would be amazed how much people are uh how understanding people are i used to deliver in three to five business days now i'm delivering two months and people are willing to wait is that mainly because of covid yeah yeah so that's uh, uh covid did both it increased my demand uh, so my growth rates are 400 percent uh 500 percent depends on, on the month that uh, you're looking at but my production capacity uh, went down by a half, essentially. When, less people on the floor, less uh, ability to produce. When someone buys, buys your product, is it, is it a lifetime buy or, or, or do you like, it, it goes out of like, it goes out of start on five years and you replace it five years. Once you sell, sell your product, is that is this the only sale you can get from them? Uh, and yes and no, because I can, I can add some uh, add-ons, but uh, here's, here's how I see it. When somebody buys, they buy a product for life, but they, they advertise it to their friends and family. Uh, and this is how I get additional value, right? So they don't buy, their friends buy. So that's why- I know, like how you look at that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people look at, oh, this is a one-time buy and you know. Yeah, there was a company, uh, one of my odd jobs. I was a, 
uh, translator slash negotiator. And uh, these guys came in to buy shoes. And this company, a, a US made company, they were making so, uh, shoes so good that they will last for years. And uh, at some point, they saw decline in their sales because nobody needed a second pair of shoes. They were so good. So they started manufacturing lesser quality shoes, or they were just puzzled how to do it. So one way was, uh, hey, can we design shoes that kind of break, so to speak? And nobody then nobody would buy lesser quality shoes. So they were puzzled. But uh, in my case, I see it different. The market is just huge. You know, I have 10 million families in America that can buy it. I'm not focused on not being upsell on that particular customer because I know even the picture they send me and the video they send me, it's my free marketing product that I can amplify. Other people see it, 10 people buy just because they saw that one picture. So I get a lot of reward. If I could afford it because I'm a self-funded business, if I could, I would have given away product for free to the first 100 customers just to build them. I couldn't afford that. So that's why I took a little uh, slower. I had no investors. Nobody would believe that, you know, crazy idea. Everybody in Seattle wants to invest in software, right? And I was like, well, this is a real business with real margins. You want to invest in software and lose your money? You're okay with that, but I'm giving you a real business plan. You don't like that. Right. So now they're like, they are trying to give me money and I don't want their money anymore because now I can sustain my own growth. So I'm like too late guys. You know, <laughs> kind of thing. So talk about this. Like, I think a lot of Americans, I mean, they might realize maybe they don't that a lot of products are actually made overseas. Of course, China is a big market. Yeah. Talk about your decision making process, like the supply chain, all that kind of stuff. Why do you decide to make your product in Russia versus here? So it is, it just happened that my product is made overseas, but it doesn't matter. Um, if you, so for example, initially I wanted to do US made products for multiple reasons. A, because I didn't want to deal with supply chain. Um, so it, it's a P times Q uh, formula, right? You either raise the, you, you, to make uh, some money, right? Uh, let's go 100,000. You have price multiplied by quantity. So you either raise the price or raise the quantity or both in order for you to make more money. A simple formula. I also add to that formula, formula letter F for frequency. Right, so price multiplied by quantity multiplied by frequency, how often they buy you know, for some products. So in essence, uh, you can be selling a, a car or a house. You can sell one house for a million dollars and you can sell two of those per year and you can make your 100K, right? Something like that. Or you can sell a lot of water bottles and make 20 cents on a bottle, but you need to sell millions of those, right? And to make something. So it's just P times Q. I love US made products. Uh, they're usually higher quality, they're more expensive. Uh, if you are not in that category, your customers are, let's say, uh, are in different income bracket, you may, you may not be able to understand it. why would they buy some expensive product? I'm always trying to save and how would they pay $10,000 for a couch? The fact that you don't understand your potential future customers doesn't mean that you cannot sell. You have to learn. So if you have ability to learn, it doesn't matter if it's manufactured overseas or not. Right. These days, I like a lot of, I, I like a knowledge industry, um, knowledge, uh, digital knowledge sharing industry. I love it. I see a tremendous growth and opportunity. I spent a year investing and in, uh, learning how to do that. Still haven't kind of monetized on that. But there's so many opportunities that um, when you're in this businessman, entrepreneur mindset, it's just everywhere. So, for example, some people want to sell cars. I don't want to sell cars. I want to sell windows for the cars. Right. Or like, for example, uh, you don't get to learn that at school, but then if you drive in Florida in whatever, you see this rich homes, you're like, what do you do? We sell fertilizer. Right. It's like, it's not sexy, but you can make millions or you sell like, you know, people see computers. Well, great, but you cannot get into it, but sell cardboard boxes for computers, you know, like whatever stuff is. There's components that you can get into, you can manufacture. People are not, especially here, when you go to business school, we're not you forget how many businesses you can create. You just don't know, but they're out there. So, um, and it's not a usual exercise. It's like Google. It's available. You can search and find information for anything, but rarely people ask the questions. Yes. So how often do you go back to, to Russia in the Ukraine? I've never traveled. So uh, since uh, I left Ukraine- It's been a while. 14 years ago. I you haven't, haven't been back? No, it's long story. You made some you know, uh, mistakes in my immigration process, moved. Uh, they lost my case and all these things. So yeah, I, essentially I can go. I can I'll come back potentially. Okay. And uh, probably I can, but it's just the, the risk. So I want to back to something else. I think about a good point. You're talking about how you're doing coaching and personal investing. Like so many people don't invest themselves, right? They, they just yeah. don't. Like there's a story on uh, ESPN like, about a month ago, maybe a week ago. I lost track of time. 
Yeah. Where so LeBron James invests like a million dollars in himself every year, right? Whether in, you know, fitness or whatever the case may be, right? And so few of us invest in our own self growth, right? So it's very weird to me. So back to my student college uh, years, right? I said, listen, how much would you pay me uh, if I give you, uh, uh, so right now you're, let's assume you're confident that you will get a job for 60K. But how much would you pay me if I give you a job for 80 or, or help you, right? I, I cannot give you a job, but help you to greatly increase your chances so you can get a job for 80K. So therefore, $20,000 increase. 20,000, yeah, that's a very big increase right. just for so, one year. So how much would you pay me for the services right now? So let's assume I, I go to you and I say like, how much would you, so let's assume you want to make a hundred K and that's what you're applying. Mm -hmm. If I advise you and you get 20 K more, how much would you pay me for it? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. So the right answer would be 20 K mm -hmm. because uh, if, if I don't help you, you just get your hundred K job, right? Mm -hmm. If I do help you, you had one, one twenty. So uh, by getting my advice, in theory, you, can, you should pay me $19,999 yeah. and you're still $1 better off. Mm -hmm. So if you're even $1 better off, you should listen to my advice. You should use my services. You should use HR services, whatever services, right? So if they make you just a little bit better, it doesn't matter the price. So a higher job may uh, also mean higher opportunities. You make that money back within one year, but then you keep making that $20,000 extra. Uh, the following year and things like that. Coaching is the same thing, right? So you invest, you spend money and people, you know, you know this uh, behavioral psychology, right? Uh, when you make a hundred dollars, you're happy, but okay. But when you lose $10, you're like, so, you know, you, people have a lot greater risk, uh, a, a lot of greater fear of um, uh, loss aversion versus uh, making something. And uh, when they, they don't see, I buy coffee, I get an immediate, co you know, the cup, I give you money, I give you a cup, a cup of coffee immediately. That span of time, that's what differentiates, you know, the standard mindset versus a little bit more of a growth mindset, right? Investing makes you better. That's, the, that's why in the U.S., the only loan that you still cannot get rid of is your school student loan, right? Because even they know that this is the, the highest value you can potentially get. Whatever goes in your head, you can take it out. They can take your home. It doesn't matter. So uh, speaking of fear of being poor, which a lot of people have, even here, it doesn't matter. Um, if they take my car, my business, my everything out, I, I still can build another business. I still, I still have that ability. So I'm not afraid to lose anymore that much as I used to, because I used to be afraid to lose my server job, my bartender job, my whatever job I was afraid. Now I'm not, not so much. And I actually expect to lose some of it. My business is great right now. The minute somebody notices it, they build the business just like yours. They try to come after you. Nothing is, uh, you know, forever. But uh, if you have a flexible mindset, you just open for another opportunity and they can execute on that. So you've been successful in different business environments, different demographics, different cultures. What's been your key to being successful in all these different so other environments? I got lucky uh, because of the fact that I came here with zero uh, knowledge of English. And that forced me to understand people and forced me to not assume so uh, I've seen Asian people arguing to death. I thought they gonna they would kill each other. Apparently, they were talking about the soccer game, and they were very friendly. Uh, the fact that I didn't know, I didn't understand the words, made me uh, learn the body language first. Then I uh, I lost all the assumptions. So if you are saying what I think you are saying, I would ask myself three times: Are you? Do you actually really mean it? Or because I my my initial peer group were other immigrants that also barely spoke English. They could be Bulgarians or whatever. They also didn't understand the meaning of words uh, to the full extent. So I had to question everything. So the key to success is literally understanding and questioning everything. Right? The, I watch the news. A lot of people just consume. I analyze, right? So I listen to sales presentations because I love them. You listen to what they're selling. I'm, I'm looking at how they do it. What buttons are they pushing and all this thing. You go to the restaurant, I also go to the restaurant, but I look at their operations, I look at their menu, and I'm like, well, they still sell uh, three types of eggs Benedict, you know, one with the spinach, one with the salmon, and one the regular one. But I like salmon and I like spinach. You know how much money restaurants could have made if they just combined spinach and salmon and charge the extra for that, right? So I see missed opportunities everywhere. So that's kind of my gift because I question everything, ask why, 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 
this and that. So I, I can strive in any industry, HR doesn't matter. So I can give you advice on how to make more money with HR, right? Because I think HR is done a little bit, not to say wrong, but uh, could, I, I should say that it could be, if I were to do HR, I would have done it differently. Right. So my, uh, so this is a good point to bring this up and you yeah. probably don't remember this. Yeah. When I first thought I got an idea for cabinet HR, you know, is this a business I can do? I talked to 331 people, right? And you were one of the people I talked to. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember, they gave me a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things to think about, a lot of strategy and it's like, it's a really good session. So I want to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I may, I can, I can give you a couple a couple thoughts on what I think about it. Yes. So, um, I think one place where I, where I saw good execution of HR and when I say HR, in this case, I'm, I'm talking about hiring. I'm not talking about onboarding or compensation because it's also HR professionals that do that. But let's talk about placing people, right? Uh, at the university, I think they got it right. They call it career management services, right? So I, I like the idea because they have students and they try to place them. The only thing they did wrong, they, they kind of lied to you. They call it career management services, but they should have been called placement services because they only do it once. If I were to do HR, I wouldn't manage client. Uh, so my clients would not be Microsoft, Amazon. My client would be a group, of, a book of people, essentially. So I would manage careers. So that's why I've seen some successful HR professionals that come to the universities to speak and educate students that at some time, uh, at some point in your life, you need to manage your career. What I mean by that? If you have a book of software, let's assume you like software engineers. If I had a book of 20 software engineers, I would be giving them a call a year later. How are you doing in your job, right? No HR ever called me, right? I never used HR services, but nobody, some, some people would place me, they would get their cut, but they would never follow up. Because if I know, I would give you a call. So are you growing your skills? Is your job helping you to grow? What do you do? For, I would have that conversation with every person in my book of business, so to speak. Six months a call, a year long call. Say like, listen, I know you love your job, but it's time for you to move. I'm telling you, you got to move. The people that got it right are sports agents, uh, movie industry agents, right? They manage people. They don't manage clients. So their clients are not movie producing studio. I mean, they are, they are also clients, right? But they spend more time with the helping the actual person to build their career. So that's how I would do it. So therefore you have different, uh, so now speaking of business, what can you offer? You can offer courses, you can offer account, uh, uh, consulting, coaching. You can offer so many things to the same person versus trying to chase contract with Amazon, contract with Microsoft, right? So then if you have a, a person that you know for years, you know their skills, then you can find that you're, you now you have another book of business. You have options, Microsoft, Amazon, Costco, whatever, all of these companies in Seattle. But then you say, I also have people in Miami, this, this, and that. You go there. So you manage their careers. So that's how I would do it. That's right? a great point. Yeah, that's, that's great. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. So, so on your LinkedIn, and we talked about this in a pre-talk, on your LinkedIn, you have an article posting where it talks about how Eagles lived to 70 years old and around 40, like they're, they're being so dull, talents are not sharp. And so I have to decide whether to die at 40 or go to a mountain that goes this painful process where basically they break their beak, grow a new beak, pluck their fellas out, you know, grow new talents. It's this painful process goes on like, I think it's like 150 days, I think it was. Maybe, I don't remember the extra details. Yeah. But then after the change, they, they do this great flight, you know, the new eagle. And you, and you uh, talk about how most people are in the same process, right? They're content. They're in the same lead. They're not changing. They're basically, they're, they're, they're alive with their dead as far as career. And talk about how difficult it is for people to change and why they should change when the time's right. Yeah. And uh, this is, this couldn't be more timely, right? Uh, considering the corona and all these things, that's um, some people would take as a great bad thing, but I see it as a great good thing, a great, great opportunity for people to change and live a better life. So essentially the birds at 40 years old, I, it's been a while since I read that article, but uh, essentially midlife, they have to do a process of rebirth. So if they don't do it, they can't eat anymore and they literally die. So for them, it's a survival thing. But uh, a lot of people, so I graduated with a degree in finance and people label me, uh, label me as a finance guy. But I know so much about marketing, sales. I, if I get anybody on a call, my, my current close rates are uh, 99%. Uh, if, if somebody, if my, one of my clients called, I always sell. 
is because this is how well I understand. But my degree is in finance. So nobody would ask me for help with the sales training and things like that. Uh, another point, if you decide to get another bachelor's right now, it wouldn't, let's assume you never had a bachelor. It would take you four years to get one right now. It's not that difficult. Even, you know, no matter the age, you can literally go. So if you're 50 years old, in theory, you can spend four years. And by 54, you come up with another degree, right? And you can make money. And nowadays you can say, but it's not going to take you four years to get second bachelor. It would take you two, right? In theory. And uh, we live in a great time when you don't have to go to official university. You can get, well, if you want, you can still go to Stanford and get a certificate in this, certificate in that, and do self-study. But the point is people should and can uh, change their careers, their knowledge, their expertise, everything. They can. They just think for some odd reason. That's once they, when they were 20, they made a decision to major graduate in, in a particular area. That's it. They are no longer capable of switching careers and, uh, and, and doing things like that. So that's kind of my, uh, I still don't understand why people are, are not as flexible as, as they could have been. Uh, life happens, you get kids, you get this, you get less time. But nonetheless, I think it's more of a mental block for a lot of people. I agree. That they're not a mental you know, block. They're yeah. comfortable with the routine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to me, it is. And I think it's going to change. So now with the corona, it pushed a lot of people to rethink. Even this ridiculous government uh, advertisement now. They do something else, right? Uh, yeah. If, I mean, you can dwell on it. You can be upset with the government, what they say and how crazy they are and how they should reopen your restaurant and everything. But it's, a, it's essentially a durability test, right? Or not, not the durability. What's the word for it? Uh, resiliency test, yeah. right? If, if Corona didn't happen, something else would happen. Age would happen, literally. You know, in Ukraine, if you're 35 years old, you already have three times harder, uh, you know, it, it, to get a job for you is three times harder. 40, it's like you're almost done. I swear, right? So in this country, you're lucky because you have- So in Ukraine, at 40, you might as well go to the restaurant home, the senior citizen home. Uh, well, um, different people still do, but they hold on to the job that they got earlier and they take an advantage and things like that. So, I mean, it's changing, right? But I'm just giving you extreme examples that uh, in some other countries, if you're young, uh, you run, you spend energy, you execute, you can take advantage of it. When you're getting older, literally, uh, a lot of people assume you, you should be getting paid more, but I don't want to pay you more if a 20-year-old can do it. So therefore, I'm just not going to hire you, right? In general, right? I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. But in general, this is how dangerous it is to be complacent, right? If you just leave it up to a manager to hire, uh, and by the way, you know, there's a difference between manager hire and HR hire. We, we understand that, right? So the, a lot of times HR just brings person to the door and then manager who is typically never qualified to understand people. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. A lot of people think yeah. HR hires. Yeah. Not, no, HR might bring them in, but it's a, the hiring manager exactly. does the hiring. Exactly. Which makes my job easier, actually, because HR people get to see so many people. They can call the bluff. They can understand. Managers don't know. They don't do it. That's why it's for to me. It's so easy to sell to a manager because they're just uh, just a human, right? So if I understand their uh, fears, the fear of managers, like, hey, I want to uh, deliver a quality job. I want to like you because I'm going to see you on a daily basis, and uh, you have to help me to get promoted, type of thing. You know, like whatever whatever happens in the manager's mind, right? Uh, which could be different from HR. HR would be like, okay, you guys are very unstructured. You need somebody who is very very structured. And then you bring a very, very structured person and he starts making a list and the, and the manager's like, oh no, I don't like this. We're all chaos. You know, you pull a chair, you work on whatever project. HR goes like, no, you need this to balance your, and manager will be like, no, you don't understand it. And that's why you end up having. Yeah. I kind of know like HR people, their, their complaint is like a hiring manager gives them like the, the way they, like the, what they want for the job. HR brings it and the hiring manager, oh, I changed my mind. I want this now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So HR also makes, make mistakes, but at least they have, a lot of, uh, uh, so one mistake, for example, in HR, I call them, uh, so it's going to sound interesting, but I say HR are the most dangerous racist people, <laughs> right? The most dangerous racist people. What I mean by that, if HR is racist, and I use racist because it's not a hot topic right here, but it could be whatever. The, uh, what's the word when you don't uh, like the, uh, 
particular country. It's uh, not the racist, but anyways. Ethnicity. Right. So when you, when you have bias, right? But we all have biases, but HR are the most dangerous. Why? Because uh, uh, there are only a few people get shot, but so many people get, get, uh, get um, uh, punished with a salary, right? So if HR is biased, uh, or makes a mistake based on whatever uh, you know predisposition is, and it results in a lower pay, or or say, oh, you're not qualified for this job. You're essentially cutting off opportunities for that person, and then it becomes a, a, a cycle, right? So, the mistakes or the damage that HR can do if if the wrong if if something's not wrong is a lot greater than on that police officer, or whatever this stuff is. So uh, anybody can make mistakes, but you have to understand. The whole process to understand why you're not getting a job or why you're getting a job it's it's you have to see the full picture uh, of being able to navigate that process better yes so also on your linkedin and this will be an interesting conversation i think you had a post on there where you said if i remember right you had a dream or you're hallucinating where you had a plan to move us to mars some kind of way yeah so that was I think maybe that was during a time when uh, Elon Musk uh, shot another rocket. Yeah, it, it, it was like an eight-minute video on Elon Musk, like narrating his, his, his one of his rocket launches. Yeah, so here's what I like to do. It's one of my hobbies. I like to um, challenge people's minds. So sometimes I call some of my, uh, I used to call some people square-headed, right? Because you're in a box. And I'm like, no, I'm out of the box. No, but you're in a box that is just put in a different perspective. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is um, a lot of people don't spend their mental energy on uh, critically analyzing information, ideas. And a lot of time your brain is in a consumption mode. So in this case, Elon Musk is a great guy. He, is, uh, you know, he figured out how to do something that to me actually seems quite obvious, how he streamlined the process. I was just surprised why nobody else before him did that. How they, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, how to make rockets cheaper by reusing the uh, certain stages. So I could understand why nobody else did it before, but I, I, maybe I do. It's because people had this, they, they were brainwashed. The rocket space is for not people. Yeah, it's only for, NASA does that, right? No one else can do it. Yeah, only yeah. NASA can do so it. Nobody that. even dared to think. So I just uh, threw a random idea and I said, listen, uh, it's going to take so many years uh, to fly the rocket to the Mars. We are not going to make it. It, it literally the light years in travel is going to make you, you're going to die. So you either have to make kids on your way there and then completely different people will land on Mars without engineering knowledge or whatever knowledge is, right? They're kids. You have to do, or you can move an entire planet and it sounds crazy, right? But this is just to give you an idea that uh, you can think you can, uh, you can offer different. That's what I do for businesses, right? Because businesses are like, okay, I need to get from point A to point B. We need to fly the rocket from the Earth to the to the to the space. Why not to move an entire planet? So maybe there is a possibility. Maybe not now. Maybe in general. Maybe not our planet. Maybe a, a smaller uh, a smaller thing. I don't know how to do it, but I just threw an idea to kind of boil boil the pot, if you will, kind of steer steer the pot, so you can figure. Oh, maybe it is possible. Maybe we can jump on some uh, a vehicle, right, and then somehow figure out how to manage we don't know a lot so right now it sounds like a crazy idea tomorrow we figure out how to move uh, magnetic fields whatever the stuff is yeah but 300 years ago if you told people yeah. in the what 1600s you know there'll be what's going on now they would have thought you were crazy too right yeah but uh you know like one more down to earth uh thing uh at microsoft for example i i pitched so many ideas uh, to the hackathons for the same reasons because i was just surprised how um, uh, they say engineers are the source of innovation. And I'm like, no, you have 100,000 people in the company and you only give this uh, creativity power to a handful of people. I, I couldn't understand that. Uh, so I brought a lot of ideas to hackathons. Uh, Microsoft engineers will bring ideas how to build a beehive and a computer. I'm like, oh, great, but it's like such a small idea. Uh, one time, one year idea uh, that helped to not waste food in the cafeteria one uh, if not the first place, but like second place. I'm like, really? And that's the extent of your thinking? Uh, I, and I get the situations a lot. I went to a Stanford uh, panel for MBA when I was considering applying for Stanford. And I asked the people, uh, if you had unlimited powers, what would you change about Stanford curriculum 
And they said, well, you have this power of changing, adding subject and this and that. I'm like, wow, wow. That's a, you could have think, you could that's have limited like, thinking. Oh, very limited. So that's, that's one of my, my pet peeves, right? Where, where people are managers or boss or leaders that have no vision, right? Like, are you kidding me, right? You, you know, power position of leadership, you have no vision for your company. Like you just do yeah. the same thing. Like have some kind of do something, right? I just, that's one yeah. of my pet peeves. So I'll, I can give you a couple of ideas just so, so you can see how my mind works. For example, uh, Microsoft had HoloLens and I said, oh, why don't we come up with the eye trainer for HoloLens? Uh, so uh, eye muscles is the muscles that you use on a daily basis more than any other muscle, right? You wake up, you're already on your phone and you, you fall asleep. That's literally the last muscle that, <laughs> that, that gets disconnected type of thing. And we brush our teeth, we train our biceps uh, once in a while, but we never exercise our eyes. So I said, well, whole lens is a perfect for it because it's AR, right? So augmented mean, reality, so you can focus uh, somewhere close by and then you can have a fo focus on something further away, therefore train your eye muscles, things like that. Then my idea was to put uh, street view cameras on USPS trucks. I feel like these ideas are completely <laughs> in the different fields. Well, why USPS? It's the government uh, shipping services that always go bankrupt. And uh, yet we have Google and uh, now Bing maps that want to have the most current maps of the street view. So these trucks go into every single community every single day. So you can literally have the most current maps by literally putting that in a 3D mapping thing. On it. So I had, you know, then, then I pitched a billion dollar ideas. I literally went and print out and then I sent emails to the big, big, big um, executives at Microsoft. Literally see them at the cafeteria, go and talk to them. So I don't care about the ranking. So um, I, I don't have that kind of uh, limitation of, oh, they're so uh, you know, like far away, you cannot talk to them. Uh, I asked a couple of very tricky questions at Microsoft uh, as well. That's what I'm known for. But I always try HR question, if you want. Uh, one time we had uh, the VP, uh, EVP, so Executive Vice President of uh, HR, right? And I said, well, why don't we innovate in HR space? And she said, what do you mean? Uh, and I didn't have a good idea, so I just brought it up. I said, well, why don't you let me pay to my manager? And she said, like, well, who's your manager? And everybody started laughing because she, she thought that I was trying to punish my manager. Mm -hmm. But I explained, well, think about this. If I have a good manager who gives me a, a clear direction, supports me in my function and everything, I just deliver great results. So why don't you give me an ability to compensate my manager? Not 100%. Maybe, maybe it could be a hundred dollars, maybe five thousand dollars, maybe whatever that is, right? Uh, it could be something tangible, could be something numb. And she said, Well, we have surveys, but surveys is not the same thing. Surveys are a joke when it's attached to a dollar. And imagine if I'm a manager, it's a hundred dollars that I could have gotten from you, but I'm only getting 70. I would get upset mm -hmm. if it's 30 dollars and I'm making a quarter million bucks. I would get upset, and I would, if I'm a good manager, I would say, like, Hey, why? What can I do different? You know, what, what's wrong? Tell me, right? Uh, I'm, I'm very open. And I would say, well, uh, this is how my brain functions. And this is how you, you told me this. This is where it is connected. And therefore, I didn't deliver to the best of my capacity, right? It's just an example of a creative idea, right? I'm not saying it's a good uh, thing. I'm not saying this is a solution to a problem. It's just different. Right? So I had a talk yesterday on, on my podcast with a guy who was in Air Force before. He, had a, uh, he actually did a program where, you know, in the military, most of other corporations, you know, the boss, you know, does the performance appraisal of the employee, right? He came with a program where the employee actually did appraisal of the, of the supervisor, right? Of course, the military, mm -hmm. the killer, right? When they messed up, what's a great, what's a great, great plan, right? Because if you're a boss, you know, what better way to improve yourself, get employee, feedback from your employees, you know? Because most yeah. employees, they don't give you feedback. Yeah. And, and you have to take it with a grain of salt because the police of course, may of course. not know the right thing, but it's just an offer. Because a lot of times, Microsoft or any other big company can hire I, and they just, they can pay top dollar. So they go to top schools and they hire people from top programs, MBA, whatnot, doesn't matter. And, but they all learn the same thing. So at one point in time, I, I, I used to, I, I asked this question to a Microsoft CFO and I said, listen, you know, you, you all talk great about this diversity programs and everything. So here's your canvas, right? And you have uh, one color, white color, right? Because like the assumption is all white. But you say you start bringing colors, you know, orange, red, yellow, black, doesn't matter. You put it all on a nice picture and it looks great. Now it's a colorful image of something. Ideally, you would create a picture of this, right? But then what I had a feeling 
that uh, the missing step, not only for Microsoft, but for a lot of companies, the missing step would be an integration. And they claim to have these programs, but if you would just mix these colors together, you literally choose to do like this. It becomes this like gray, incoherent. It's not even a picture. If you mix all the colors on your palette, it's gonna be a dirt. So you gotta keep the colors. You gotta realize there are differences. There are different nationalities, languages, cultures, this and that. Don't mix them together because a lot of times companies want to blend in, uh, blend everybody in, in the same culture. So that's what was missing, uh, in my opinion. So I just offer another uh, kind of uh, approach as well, right? Um, she liked the question, but I don't think anything was done with that. Uh, but that's why uh, at the company, at, and we, you know, the reason I keep bringing up Microsoft is because they can afford to hire the best people. They can afford to experiment and everything. Not a lot of small businesses can do that. And yet I said, I'd rather hire five white guys if they all think differently versus doing what you're doing. You're hiring simply because, you know, Latino, the black, whatever the stuff is to look on paper that you have diversity, but you may not. If you all hire them from Michigan University, they're not different. You know, they all went through the same brainwashing program for four years or got their master's all brainwashed the same way. And I'm not saying, not, not saying bad way, just the same way, which could be a bad way too. So, and they didn't like that uh, part. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they didn't. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, this is just kind of to give you an, a, another perspective. If you, if you don't fit in, if you question uh, dogmas, if you uh, question everything that had been done for years, sometimes it's not the right place for you to be in a very structured corporate world. So I've learned a lot about the processes, a, a lot of great stuff that I've learned, but uh, I decided to, I can now take off and do something on my own. So I have a pipeline of projects that I want to do. So I'm taking it, you know, one step at a time. But the point is, um, you, you know, it's um, uh, kind of bringing it back to the point of entrepreneurship versus this. Uh, there, there's so many opportunities. Once I left Microsoft, first of all, nobody called me. So that, and I have good friends and we, we still talk and everything, but that, that thought of yours that like, Oh, I have this beautiful company here and everybody treats it. Once you, once you're out and, and actually a lot of people left and I didn't call either, you know, for various reasons I wanted, but then I forgot. And uh, just a good test. How many phone numbers, cell phone numbers of your coworkers do you have? A lot of people don't, a lot of people don't have cell phones of their coworkers that I worked for years with. So that's another example of how uh, what you see, uh, uh, perceive, perceive like a, this is what it is, but yeah. when you do a real stress test, it's not. So I just hope that uh, I know that we are probably running uh, way out of time, but uh, it's just kind of my message to everybody, just expand. I've seen people that were literally stressed and cried when they got laid off from Microsoft and I was the happiest guy. And I'm like, why? And some people got six months, a year, packages and everything I'm like this is an opportunity of a lifetime you know travel this this not right now i'm just uh, i wake up at 6 a.m because like there's so many opportunities that i want to execute and sometimes i can't you know i just mind blowing how many opportunities there are out there and people just miss them you know so you have all these ideas that you have going on every day in your mind how do you like rank order these ideas like suppose you have like 30 ideas today how do you say this idea number one number two number three i might have time to focus on this and like yeah. So I have ideas that I can execute and I have ideas that I cannot execute. So at one time I emailed Jeff Bezos. I'm like, dude, I have this idea for you. I'm missing out so much money. Of course, I got a hold of his assistant and she's just like, oh, well, that's legal. This, we don't solicit ideas. I'm like, well, that's why, you know, that's, that's why you guys suck, you know, <laughs> so to speak. I mean, I didn't say that, but I was quite, quite pissed. And then I said, I have a billion dollar idea and she would probably 20 year old. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that, but because it kind of sounds bad, but, um, anyways, so some people, you know, they have this job description and they don't, don't. they do it only that. Yeah. So my ideas in, in terms of ranking one to three, uh, I know my, my weaknesses and one of them is, uh, in a bit, well, now I'm trying to do better, but if I focus on one thing, I do it really well. If I focus on five different things I do it well. So my focus for 2020 actually you know, brings me back to HR is hiring people and expanding myself a little bit. Uh, that's where, this is where I, I, you know, at the beginning I couldn't hire people. Now I can. And this is, you know, when I hire, I 
I've learned the art of delegation a long time ago. Right now, before now, I wasn't able to afford to hire anybody. But because I didn't hire anybody, it took me so long to grow. So now my, my strategy is to de delegate to a lot more people. So do a, a build a real company, expand it with uh, people brains. And right now it's just so many opportunities to even pick a good brain, you know, for, uh, you know, provide everything uh, that they need, you know, the stability, uh, whatever, whatever they need, right? Knowledge, I can share a lot of knowledge and give them extra place to work and things like that. So, uh, and then I will execute on a second idea, third idea. I have a product, uh, a product pipeline for this existing business. I'm also working on, uh, uh, and when I say working, this is just free brainstorming idea when I, when I park them for now, because I don't want to uh, get into that trap of not being focused on one thing. Yes. So yeah, I understand you have a gift for our listeners today. Um, so gift. Yeah. Um, well, my gift is you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's one gift. If you have a business and you think that you're stuck, I can give you a free uh, call it half an hour consult session and free because it's not my line of business. This is me just uh, getting my uh, karma points, right? Uh, and uh, getting my creative juices flowing. Uh, I'm very approachable. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and I can give you uh, potentially some ideas on what to do with your existing business that you might have uh, might have not thought about. Um, then uh, if you're interested in the uh, uh, home play gyms that I sell, you can always reach out to me. So, uh, and you can probably work out some sort of discount on that. Um, this is through my website. You can just go to brainrichkids.com and find a phone number and email. I usually get those. So I'm not like Jeff Bezos says that he reads emails. I actually do read emails and that customers send. And uh, yeah, so um, a, a lot of times uh, people undervalue what that means when I say you can reach out to me because uh, people that do reach out, they get tremendous amount of benefit. And uh, people that told me that in the past, I missed on that uh, thing. A lot of people say like, oh, just give me a call and I will help you. And I never did. And that was a big mistake. Yeah, it's a good point. So, like, a lot of people, oh, they're just saying that. No, when people say, reach out and call me, 99% of the time they actually mean it. They're, and they're actually expecting you to call. Yeah. And if you don't call or don't follow up, they're kind of disappointed because they really want to help. Yeah. I left a lot of opportunities on the table uh, because I didn't follow up and because I didn't call. So that's why... You know, if, if I talk to somebody, I'm like, yeah, call, you know, do that. So speaking of reaching out, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can, can reach out to you? So it's uh, Brain Rich Kids pretty much everywhere. Uh, Brain Rich Kids, uh, Brain Rich stands for Very Smart. Uh, that was actually a name for the software company that I adopted for, for the kids project. Um, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way to find me. That's how you find me. I take a, I take a little longer to respond because I'm not looking for a job and that's why I don't check it that often. But, uh, but yeah, my cell phone number is there. I, I, I don't want to say it publicly so I don't get you know, blasted with the phone calls or anything. But uh, if you send me an email, I usually respond. If you have a clear ask, that would be even better. Uh, yes. Not just like help me with something. But uh, yeah, uh, I love helping businesses, especially business owners that don't have luxury of hiring consultants and things like that. This is just my way of paying forward. And this, that's why I know so much about so many industries because I help so many people. And that's why I recognize opportunities because I've been, uh, I understand a lot of industries. I understand healthcare, I understand hospitality, I understand even construction, you know. So I, I did some business development for construction as well. Software, I mean, I, I get a lot of things simply because I was helping people uh, with their businesses. So that's how I get exposed to a lot of these problems. And for our listeners, we'll have is uh, links on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cabinetsaytobalock.com. Be sure to share the episode with your friends. So for the record, since I messed your name up, can you say your first and last name for everyone? It's uh, Yegor, uh, with the emphasis on the O, and Yegor, not Vord. With yes. a double Y at the end. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge <laughs> to pronounce. So we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, right now, uh, to, to your listeners, well, uh, let me think. I would say, uh, well, what do I want to talk about? HR. I give you a couple of ideas on, uh, on what to do with HR businesses. Um, so let me think. If I were in the audience, right, uh, I'm thinking what kind of questions would I ask? 
I'm thinking uh, a lot of times. So, for example, maybe I should talk about the learning curve a little bit and uh, trying to. Uh, I'll give you one interesting example of how I managed learning curve recently. So I wanted to do marketing. I had a lot of theoretical knowledge. I didn't know how to do it. So I went and I used to, and I and I got a job at a local value college. So um, people don't consider that there are jobs outside of what they would perceive. Like if you work at the bank, you don't think that you can get a job by teaching by becoming a professor. So uh, that that's just one example of how you can overcome a learning curve or how you can divert to slightly different industry, polish your skills and do that. I was overqualified to teach. I was overqualified in marketing, but I had nothing on paper. So I got a job again without the resume. They didn't even know that I had marketing knowledge and nothing on my resume said it. Uh, that's like another story how I got the job. But I was exposed to another world of government jobs. I had no idea that, first of all, they pay. Uh, I didn't do it for a pay because the pay was actually tiny. So I spent more time on this. But I was learning how to teach. Uh, and, and when you teach, you learn the best, right? So even Einstein used to say, if you don't know how to explain well enough, that means that you don't understand it well enough. Same thing. I went to teach. That forced me to digest, to, uh, to simplify my ideas, my understanding of marketing. So I could able to deliver to 20 year olds uh, to do that. So I enjoyed it. I used to teach one class per semester and then uh, I just uh, started teaching them too much. Uh, so uh, just to give an idea, sometimes uh, marketing students graduate without running a single ad. Right? That's not possible. Well, because then you would have to ask for money for students. Yeah. To pay. Yeah. And then I'm crossing the line between uh, asking what to pay. But I'm like, no, you're studying marketing. So I made my students pay five bucks. Uh, and I said, well, you just run the ad and you cancel right away. But sometimes you still get charged. So anyways, the damage was five bucks. And just a, an example of sometimes of how they, to, they told me, you, can, you have all the flexibility. And then I realized I cannot travel while I'm teaching, apparently. Because if you have an in-person class, you have to show up. Otherwise, you're breaking the law. So apparently, I wasn't even breaking the law when I said I can teach this one particular class online. So that's why I kind of stopped doing that, uh, simply because I got overwhelmed. But this is just an idea. That if you think that you cannot get a job, you work for Johnson and Johnson, for example, and you're trying to get a job in finance anywhere you can't, maybe university would be an option. Maybe uh, something different could be an option. Uh, marketers, for example, I think they should never look for a job because if you are saying that you're a marketer, your job is to market. So, and if you can't market yourself, you know. Yeah, yeah. You have to come up with a plan, marketing plan, just like you would do for a business. You have to do the same thing. I'm always surprised how people are willing to go above and beyond when they have a job, when they do it for an employer and they don't do the same thing for themselves. Like if you're in finance and you don't have your own budget at home, that's kind of a question why. You do it for the company, you have goals in this. And actually I have the same thing, I don't have budget. I kind of have it in my head, but not on paper. So I'm kind of preaching what I don't do as well as I'm not perfect. But it's kind of like to give an idea how much disconnected is there. You know, between what you actually do for somebody else versus for yourself. So uh, it's kind of my pitch. Do something more for yourself. Yes. You know. Hey, so thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah thank you as well. Uh, thank you, Jason. That was a pleasure. My first experience, actually. That was great. Yeah, to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.